Morning, church. Uh, today's teaching text is Second Kings chapter five, verses one to twenty-five, and I'll be reading from the ESV uh, translation. It reads as follows: Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went, to, went in and told his lord, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel, and the king of Syria said, go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and, te and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy, only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's, Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me, and stand, and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and cure the leper. Are not Abana and, and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. And he came and stood before him and said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now, so for from now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimen to worship thee, leaning on my arm, I will bow myself in the house of Rimen. When I bow myself in the house of Rimen, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, a servant of Elisha, the man of God said, see, my master has spared this Naaman, the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from his chariot to meet him and said, is all well? And he said, all is well. My master has sent me to say, they have just now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two, cha and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and lay them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their, from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent the men away and they departed. He went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, did not my heart go 
when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Connie. That was a great job. Wow. It's really impressive. Um, whenever someone asks you to read 27 verses from the Old Testament, it's an it's a uphill battle. But you did an amazing work. Thank you for doing the effort and, and serving us in that way this morning. Um, a very obscure passage in some way, a long passage in another way. Um, we're going to be in here for probably five hours, so cancel all your afternoon plans. We're going to take time. I'm just joking. We're going to run through this story. Um, it's an amazing story. Um, in Afrikaans culture, it has an amazing comment we use a lot, van waar gehaasi, you know, from where did you come gehaasi, it's something that's always been in my mind, and as I did my Bible training, it was so amazing to read this passage and what it's actually about, so something that's really special to me and something that I hope would um, mean something to us this morning as well, um, but we'll talk more about that now, and uh, I want to ask God to speak to us this morning more importantly than anything else, so let us pray and ask that God do that this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it's living and active. Lord, thank you that it cuts deep in just exposing our hearts. Lord, even whether we're good or bad or know you or not know you, seeking you or in a deep relationship with you, Lord, you speak through your word. And we pray that your spirit will do that this morning. Lord, thank you that we can sing your praises, that we have the freedom to worship. We think of the church in Ukraine under tremendous persecution at this moment with just the war. We think of Russian churches. We think of churches all over the world. We think of um, the terrible things that happened in Nigeria this week, of Christians being killed in a stampede, Lord. We think of so many bad things where it's really difficult to worship you, Lord. We have so much privilege, Lord, to sit here this morning, drink coffee, um, and have time to reflect on your word as we continue to live this side of eternity, Lord. Please lead us, um, speak to us, and give us light and hope to where you've called us, Lord. I pray that in your mighty name. Amen. All right, so preaching from Bible narrative like we find here in 2 Kings 5 is for me by far the most exciting. Um, I can preach from Ephesians, and we can do a three-point sermon and look at something in the passage, but the color is a little bit less. And the beauty of just um, Bible narrative and how we have our Old Testament was that it was a narrative um, communication of uh, 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 a story that was always told. So a true story, but people did that by telling it to one another. So there's always color and um, in the way that they explained it, the narrative, and these markers that show us the main points. So it's so much fun to just look at it, but then not just fun in the element of linguistics, but then also of just how special it is how God worked in His people's lives. Um, there's a specific narrative that happened here. Now, Ammon really was a commander of Syria. Um, Israel was really still there where they are. The Jordan River is still there. It still is a small river. Um, all these things are still true, and we have a small view of how God worked in His people's life in a specific time and place. So therefore, it's a great excitement for me to um, preach us through this historical narrative. Um, it's not just a story, but it's factually true, and it's something that God speaks in and through us um, in His dealing with, with people. Um, so as our question of the day led us into this um, passage, um, I'm sorry for the Liverpool, the Liverpool fans, as Lesejo has seen. I could pick up he's a little bit flat this morning, and now I know why he was a little bit flat, is that his team lost last night, probably stayed up till quite late. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. But this passage that we're going to look at today is um, having many truths woven into it, but the primary thing is it's just this upside down way of how God works um, in our world, the way that the world does not work, um, the surprise of the insignificant people, and that way, the way God uses that to glorify Himself um, through His people um, for their flourishing. Um, in the world, you need to perform in order to be accepted, to be approved, but in God's kingdom, it works in a different way. The focus is on God, 
And His ordinary means that He works through His people so that the focus can be on Him. We cannot say, wow, this person was special, therefore God used him. No, 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 no. God uses ordinary people to administer His means and goodness, as we will see. All right, so context in our story this morning, all right? Syria, um, at this time in world history, was a force to be reckoned with, okay? They were already dominating Israel in battle. We know that they kind of attacked them a few times, raided them, and eventually Israel fell off the map. The northern um, kingdom of um, Israel, greater Judah, was just remaining after that. Um, but Israel was in decline, so David, Solomon... They all were gone. They were the A days. Now we're ending these last times of decline in the nation of Israel. Um, mostly because of their unbelief and trust in God. So they started to worship idols, um, mix their religion with other religions around them as they were being influenced by them and their ways, their way of worship, the things they did to appease the gods, they were being distracted. Um, we also see in our text today, as it fits in with this greater narrative of one and two kings and the greater Bible history, um, how this panned out and where we find ourselves in this narrative. But what I love about this narrative and this specific piece of history in the Old Testament is that it relates for me so much to our time and day. Um, we're a post-Christian age which we are in now. It's no more the norm that you work in, walk into the workplace and you can just assume that your boss are going to require of you to live in a Christian way, work in a Christian way, um, that you can just assume all these things. We, we post-Christian in, in one way or another. We have corrupt kings, politicians, not all of them, but many of them. Societal leaders, we have so many injustices, we have so many things that are just wrong in our society. We're not in a special time of flourishing. I mean, Russia literally decided they're just going to cruise into Ukraine and take over the country. You would think that that would happen 500 years ago, but it happened now in this time and age that we're living in. So crazy times that we live in, and it's so similar for me to what we find in this narrative of 2 Kings 5. The big idea that I want us to see this morning is that the grace of God cannot be manipulated. All right? We cannot manipulate the grace of God. It can only be humbly accepted. All right? That's the big idea I want us to see. Um, it's going to come in two parts, as Connie has read for us perfectly this morning. Um, we have part one, now Arman receiving the grace of God through the evangelism of this little Israel girl, and then Gehazi abusing the grace of God by exploiting this work of God in Naaman. All right, so that's the two parts we can look at. Um, if you have your Bible with you, please open it up. No, I'm not doing that. It's a guilt trip. Many of us carry our phones, so keep your phone. I'm sure you won't be WhatsApping or doing other stuff. Um, but I really believe that God's active word would speak with us. And because it's such a long narrative, it's really helpful to just stick um, with me through it and just keep to the main idea of what's going on that we don't get lost into the details. Um, so, who is Naaman? Um, verse 1 tells us that Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Syria. Like we said, they were heavyweights as a nation, all right? They were winning um, because of conquest, command and conquer. They were not like Russia, struggling to take over part of Ukraine. They cruised in, they took over, they flattened everything in front of them, and they were just expanding as a nation. Um, they were steamrolling everyone in their way. But Naaman was not only leading this mighty army, but he was obviously in high favor with his master, the king of Syria. I mean, if you're successful as this commander, it was the main way of conquest and growing as a nation was through this um, conflict and winning conflicts. So um, Naaman was a very important person because he could command an army um, and not just do it all right, but he was doing it really well. They were winning. They were taking over who was um, in front of them. And then we get this funny comment from the writer where he says, the Lord gave him victory. It's a crazy idea. We'll come back to the statement. But it's somewhat as a judgment on God's people for their unbelief in God. But then the writer says, he was a man of valor. He was courageous, bold. The guy leading from the front, all right? He was not that commander sitting on his horse in the back and telling his people to go and fight. He was the guy when everyone was running away from the conflict, running to the front and threatening everyone who was in front of him, all right? This real man's man leading from the front. And then the writer makes this crazy statement, a statement. He was a leper, all right? What a shock. 
probably one of the most powerful leaders in his era, but he was a leper. Now, leprosy was a common illness in Old Testament times. Um, it was a nasty, transferable skin disease that was considered as an impurity from most religious standpoints. So, from wherever you would um, look at it, people would just say, wow, you cursed. If you have this illness, there must be something wrong with you, all right? Um, similarly, in um, what we find in Leviticus 13 and 14, God's people also saw this as an impurity, something making you spiritually unclean, that there's something wrong with you. You're sinful. you not allowed to be in our fellowship here. You have to be removed from us. Finding the New Testament times, in Jesus' time, as He was coming on to His ministry, that people who were leprous in modern-day Israel were living in caves. They were completely removed from society so that they don't spread this uncleanness because they were considered unclean spiritually. So try to imagine teenagers' skin problems, but then put on that like a zombie apocalyptic you know, just zombie-like, crazy skin disease, all right? It's nasty. Um, I wanted to show you pictures, but then all of you would have canceled your lunch plans because it, it, it just made you feel bad, okay? It was really nasty. It's not like you would walk around here with leprosy and you don't pick it up. It's like you'll see it like an eyesore, no pun intended, but it is nasty, all right? So now try and imagine this poor commander, okay? He's leading one of the, wealth, uh, the wealthiest, powerful armies in the world, and he has this nasty... Skin disease that everyone can see. He's like a real sore eye to look at. Maybe that was part of his effectiveness. He would just run to the front and then everyone runs away from him. But okay, I'm reading into the narrative. Let's not, let's not do that. But you can just imagine what a dilemma this leader was experiencing, all right? He's so successful. Everyone loves him as a leader. The king of Syria has high regard for him. I mean, he's, he's made it. He's really made it. But he has this terrible thing that just disqualifies him to really have the good life. Then enter this little girl from Israel. And the writer here makes for us such a clear statement on the little and girl that enters into this world. She's one of the um, people they've taken in plunder. Verse 2 to 3, you can see there she was taken from this raid in Israel by Syria, led by Naaman properly. Um, and as part of the spoils, she would go back to then Naaman and then end up working in his house, um, serving Naaman's wife, working in a service. Imagine Downton Abbey, all right? Probably a massive house, massive amount of servants, and she's one of these. Helps her dress in the mornings, take care of all her going along, going wherever she's going, helping with ITs, all those type of things. She's working in the background, all right? Servant girl, little girl, serving in this mighty Naaman's house, all right? She obviously picks up as she's serving there that this is a big thing, all right? The almond has this terrible skin disease. Um, it's not right. It dominates a lot of the conversation, um, trying to look for healing, trying to look for outcome from this nasty illness that she has. And then she makes this amazing statement of faith, and she says, and points this mighty man of valor to this prophet who is in Samaria. He, the prophet, would cure him of leprosy in verse 3. This little girl confronts this powerful man and tells him, you need to see the prophet in Samaria. So don't miss the irony of this man of valor and this little girl. Um, the writer is really rubbing it in our faces now. And then we get to our corrupt kings who's leading at this time. So Naaman in verse 4 immediately goes to his king and pleads to send him to Israel. The king, very excited of just this possibility of healing, sends Naaman immediately to find any form of healing from this terrible disease. He obviously believes that it will help his PR. Imagine if you're leading an army or you have an army with a guy with a terrible skin disease. It's not really helping, you know, all right? You guys are following. This is crazy. He wants this guy to be healed. So he sends him to Israel to be healed from this disease. But now you must understand Syria worshipped their own god, Rimon. So they're already intermixing their faith and saying, go to this land of Israel. I know they worship their own god, but let him try and heal you. So things are very corrupt and broken at this stage. Then we get to the king of Israel in verse 7. He tears his clothes and says, am I God to kill and make alive? See how he's seeking a quarrel with me. One would at least think that the king of Israel would find himself in a position to say, let's just go to the prophet of Israel. But he makes it all about himself, and he probably thinks 
um, that the king of Syria is just trying to send Naaman so that he can command and conquer them again, raid them, come into his um, kingdom and just take things away from them as well. So things are really broken. It gives us a glimpse of this greater narrative of how God's people are just deteriorating because of their unbelieving king, how the kings around them are intermixing their faith. But thankfully we have Elisha, the true prophet of God in Samaria and Israel. So true prophets like Elisha were uniquely called by God to speak to the nation of Israel and call them to repentance and faith in God. So they were like these pointers, people calling people back to God, the people of God, leading them and being a mouthpiece for God and then also for people interceding before God as well. So they were this unique office that God gave to the prophets in Israel. So Elisha calls Naaman to come to him so that he will realize there is a prophet in Israel. So we see that in verse 8, how he calls him to come to him. And Elisha sends him away with a commandment in verse 10 to go and wash himself seven times in the river Jordan. Now Amon is shocked. He can't believe it. He at least hoped that Elisha would do something spectacular to heal him. You can just imagine how many times now Amon would go to people and ask for healing to all the nations around them. And people who they say, wow, this person you need to go to, he'll heal you. And the amount of special things he had to do. We know this in our culture, right? How many funny things you must do in order to be really healed. You know, there's this little thing or that little thing you need to do. And it's sometimes very impressive, but it just doesn't work. So Naaman is really discouraged. He just hopes at least Elisha would firstly come to him in person. It's striking there how we see um, in verse 10 that he sends his messenger to just go and tell Naaman. He doesn't even go himself. And then, secondly, to just do something impressive. Call upon God, do an amazing prayer of faith, take out a handkerchief and wave it over him. Do something impressive. Nothing of the sorts happens. Naaman just says, go, and uh, uh, Elisha tells him through his messenger, go and wash yourself seven times in the river Jordan. Now, I had the privilege to be there myself. Don't think of the Vol or the Orange River, right? Don't think of the mighty Limpopo. You must think of something like the minute Yuxke River, all right? We don't even know when we drive over it with the N1 anymore, you know? It's small. It's not impressive. Um, it's a river. It exists, but it's not nearly as impressive um, as the amazing rivers that Naaman is used to, where he's from, these mighty rivers that he mentions. He can at least go to the Abana or the Parpar that he mentions there. He says these rivers are so big, they're more than all the water in all of Israel, which is somewhat of a desert place. So why do you want me to go to this stupid river that um, you're commanding me to go? And he turns away in anger, verse 12. He just say, this is not for me. Luckily, his servants calls him to reconsider. I mean, what do you have to lose? They tell him, Naaman, you came all the way here, you brought all these gifts. Why don't you just go and do it? I mean, I know it's not an impressive river, but just go and wash yourself. I mean, what do you have to lose at the end of the day, he said, literally, wash and you'll be clean. Don't you want to do that? Obviously, you want to do that. So, Naaman swallows his pride and he washes himself seven times in the river Jordan. And immediately, his flesh was restored like that of a child. Right, miracle. All right, Naaman's lifelong struggle and battle of this terrible skin disease is gone. Nothing anymore. He's no more considered unclean and sinful. All right, massive turn in our narrative. He returns to Elisha in verse 15, overcome with joy, and makes a confession of faith in the Lord. He says, behold, I know there is no God in all earth but in Israel. But Naaman still doesn't understand how God's grace works. He wants to give something. I mean, he had all these gifts that he carried along. He wants to give something to this man of God who've healed with him from this terrible disease that he had all his life. Shows just at least some level of appreciation and to God for what he has done. But verse 16, Elijah rejects everything. He doesn't want a cent from this mighty man of valor, Naaman. Doesn't want to touch it. He pleads with Elisha in verse 17, please just help me then. How do I worship this God who doesn't want anything from me? I'm so used that I need to perform and give something to Rimon where I come from, the master king, that God that my master serves. Help me, how do I worship him? And then somewhat of a way they figure out in how this true repentance of Naaman should look like. 
Um, taking a piece of this earth back to where he's going as a symbol, sacrificing to the true God, and resting in what God has done. And Elisha blesses him in verse 19, go in peace, proving of his worship and repentance. What a great story. This mighty man of Naaman came to faith um, from a foreign nation that has afflicted Israel, but he is believing this gospel and repenting in light of that. But then enter Gazi. What a crazy story. Just as Naaman leaves overjoyed, Gazi, the servant of Elisha, who probably gave Naaman this original message in verse 10, chases him in from behind, runs after him. Verse 21, Naaman stops as he sees Gazi running toward him. Gazi sprints a story, spins a story to Naaman. He says, they, Gazi, Elisha, received visitors, and they would need to host them as the custom goes, as these um, prophet's children come to visit them, they need to host them, they need to give them some gifts, um, and the almond is just overjoyed, I mean, yes, for sure, God changed my life, I mean, at least I can give you something, and he gave him pieces of clothes, a little bit of silver, and all, as Gazi gets home in verse 25, he bumps into Elisha, and he asks him, where have you been, Gazi? Waar Gazi? He denies it, and he says, I went nowhere, your servant went nowhere, and Elisha responds with this powerful condemning statement. Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments? Or can we can say, should we be worshipping God for what he has done in the life of Naaman? Or should we be taking offering spoils from what God has done? And then as Elisha said it, the most terrible thing happened in verse 27. The leprosy of Naaman cling to Gazi, leaving him as a leper, white like snow. All right, what a story. All right, all this drama. It's like a big chiasm. As we talk about um, Hebrew literature, making this opposites. You have Naaman at the beginning, a white leper, ending with Gazi as a white leper. And then in the middle, making this main point for us, we have our Lord, the true prophet, that actually delivered this work of grace. Everyone around him is corrupt and broken, but it just points to this amazing work that God has done, and then how Gehazi must use this grace, and then receiving that terrible, terrible leprosy that Naaman originally had. All right, so I just want to make a few observations from the story that I really hope would speak to us um, this morning. So firstly, let's observe this girls, this little girl's faithfulness in her evangelism, all right? Put yourself in her shoes for a moment. So she's been raided from Israel, so she's not in the country that she was born in. She was taken captive. She has no one representing her or her issues or the struggles she's facing in this new servant role that she's doing. Um, she's um, serving as a slave, probably the lowest in society at that stage. Yes, she serves in an important house, but she has no say. There's no unions, no one representing her. She's all by herself. And she pointed one of the most powerful people of her age, of her lifetime, to the true Lord of all creation. Just imagine that. One day in heaven, we'll probably get there and rejoice for this little girl's faith in pointing this massive man of valor to God. It's an amazing reality as we think about this. And church, this should be encouraging us this morning towards our own evangelism, isn't it? How many times do we refrain from pointing someone to the Lord because we feel like, yes, but they're too important. I can't, I can't tell them about my Lord. But isn't this exactly the way that God works in and through us? It's not just our impressiveness that warrants us the ability to evangelize and speak about our Lord. It is exactly our ordinary lives that makes it a possibility for us to witness about our God. We go so far as to say, and we'll end with that, but to say we should watch out for the people who look so impressive. But God uses ordinary people like us as these missionaries that go out into all of life and society to point people to God. Many times he used terrible things like this little girl's suffering to be raided from Israel, taken captive to Syria, to serve in this house, do something very ordinary and insignificant to point this powerful man to God. We should not miss these amazing things that God does in 
and through us as ordinary people. Just think of how many Naamans woke up this morning in Pretoria and Gauteng, being completely lost. People who don't know their left hand from their right hand. People who are leprous. People who are so overcome with sinfulness and brokenness. Not knowing where to go anymore. They ran everywhere. They threw money on all their problems. But they know they're lost and they're broken. God calls us church to go to these Naamans. Whether it's at the workplace, where we're social, where we engage with other people who are lost. To be a light to those people. It cannot just be Lesejo or Reina who does our evangelism. We're all called by God's grace to take part in this amazing role of sharing our faith. And it's not something impressive. It's something as simple as I was blind, but now I can see. God calls us to just in love serve those around us who are broken and lost, whether they're super important or whether they're the lowest in society, but to love and care for them. And when the opportunity arises, to say, look to the prophet of Israel. Look to the true God. He saved my life. It's not special in bells and whistles, but he is special. He is amazing. He's the one who's changed my life completely. I have life. I have hope. I have seen like never before. And that's what God calls us to, as this young girl encourages us to do. Then secondly, um, if we look at Naaman and the way he expected something impressive to save him from this terrible disease. I think there's some very powerful things we can learn here. He thought that these rivers of healing must be impressive. He thought that the prophet must do something special or impressive to act um, or act of God to do that. Or that his money would be able to buy him actually God's appeasement. What is your expectations of God's work in your life? How do you think God's going to heal you from your leprosy, from your sinfulness? Are you sitting here this morning and looking in on Christianity, maybe as a non-Christian or someone figuring it out, um, thinking that you think, I should probably perform to appease this God. But I hope and pray that Naaman's conversion would shed some light for you on how true faith and repentance works like. The Lord uses ordinary, horizontal means to save His people. Why does He do this? So that He, the Savior, can be glorified. It's not our good deeds, our performances, the people we know, your status in society, that means anything before God. It is the God in who you trust, the prophet, the weightiness of that person that saves you. It's not on a horizontal level. If I tell you as an illustration, I am appointed as the new CEO of RMB or a big bank or business, and I studied an MBA at Oxford, you would say, Peter, yeah, it's probably a good chance that you would be the CEO. I mean, you have this wonderful degree. But if I tell you I'm the new CEO and I hardly have education, you would say, wow, that's impressive. You didn't use anything else to achieve this role. Um, you were actually impressive. So you see what this bad illustration is trying to get across. God glorifies himself through ordinary people um, so that he would look good and that we will find our hope and light um, in that. Christians, do we believe this? As the church of God, do we really believe that God works in these ordinary ways to do amazing things in our lives? If we truly get the heart of this passage of Scripture, we'll be confident in our Lord's saving work in and through us that our outer performances won't dictate the way we think or feel about our spirituality. So I've been hardly married for a year, um, and it's done some special things to me, being married. There's a level of selfishness that I discovered that I had never thought existed. A way that you just l figure out how much you really actually just live for yourself. And many other things might have happened in your life as a Christian that you just get overwhelmed with just how broken and sinful you are. This passage should be greatly encouraging for us this morning that our Savior don't save 50% of our brokenness. He saves all of it and He saves mightily and powerfully even though it does not look so impressive for you. There's no sin that He leaves unforgiven in your life. He saves it completely. He takes the leprosy away completely. Yes, I still battle with sin. I still battle with my own brokenness. But I know my prophet saved me perfectly. 
My Lord has perfectly lived the life I couldn't live. Died the death I couldn't die and overcome sin and death so that we can find life in our Father. It should be a great encouragement for us this morning if we feel overwhelmed with sin and just our own brokenness in our relationships and living this side of eternity. We never graduate from the gospel. That's the amazing truth of Christianity. This power of the gospel is the thing that you need to be saved, but it's the thing that you continuously need in order to be saved. All right? The same good news that initially saved you needs to continually sustain you as a Christian. A very simple but profound truth um, in, of the gospel. And then thirdly, we're getting to the end here. Gehazi misused the grace of God in Ammon's life and became a leper. How many curses aren't coming from the wolves and sheep clothing in our society? Let's just think about it. I didn't want to Google it last night, but if you uh, Google something like church leader exploiting church or church leader making people drink petrol or church leader making people eat like whatever. We literally had a guy before COVID, a white Afrikaans guy, so it's not just in black culture, who thought that he was the Christ here in Pretoria, and he led an amazing ministry. It was massive. There's so many sheep and wolves clothing around us. It is something that is almost unbearable. It's all over the world. There's so many people who are going to receive a curse, eternal damnation, because of this heresy and lies that they are spreading. Now, we should not rejoice that God's going to do that. I know many of these ministries might have hurt us in our past, um, we might have been hurt by that, but God's going to judge it perfectly one day. And in the meanwhile, we should pray that God would really do something in these people's lives, that they would return back to the true God and the true gospel, um, that, that we pray for them. But we need to pray for our leaders as well. We need to pray for Lesejo and Reino, that God will continue to keep them to the true gospel. Many of these false prophets started out really well and then just missed it along the way and got distracted and weren't really the true people of God. Brothers, what Lesejo and Reino are doing as leading this church is an amazing burden that they're taking on themselves. It's a massive spiritual warfare. The devil don't leave you, around, um, leave you alone when you are doing something like they're doing. Leading the church. All church leaders we know, we should continue to pray that they will remain faithful in their service to God. They won't be tempted like Gazi. Gazi came from the church. He was a leader. He was a prophet considered serving the people of God. And he got tempted and led astray. So let's continue to pray for our leaders. And then, this does not dismiss Christianity's legitimacy. Think about this. The fact that there are sheep and wolves clothing actually testifies that there is this battle between goodness and evil. That there is these... Um, people who would distract the people of God from the true gospel. So we should be awake as the people of God, assess what we learn, assess what we read, the Christian books we read, the podcast we listen to, the sermons we listen to, the people we aspire to, that we assess whether these people are teaching us the true word of God, something that we should continually do um, in our lives. All right, and then I'm finishing with this. Consider your prophet. Consider Jesus the true prophet who does not die like Elisha. He does not live on this earth anymore. Jesus still lives. He never died. His office of prophet will never end. He will always be ruling and reigning on the throne of God. And he will always be the true prophet. Let's not consider or let's consider how powerful and impressive that is. If you turn to this true prophet, he will never leave you. He will cure you perfectly from your leprosy and He will continue to work in and through you. Philippians 1.9 says, He who has begun a good work in you will bring it into completion. Let's take hope in that church this morning that our Lord continues to work and prophesy this perfect work of God in our lives. In Luke 4, um, Jesus makes this power statement and then reflects on this passage that we read today in 2 Kings 5. And He says the following this one is specifically from um, Isaiah, but then he quotes 2 Kings 5. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
Um, and then he says in verse 24 of Luke 4, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And, verse 27, there were many lep lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Crazy idea. Don't reject the true prophet. Whether you're a non-Christian sitting here this morning, hear the grace of God in which He brings to you this possibility to be cured from leprosy. You don't need to appease Him, approve Him with your performances, or be a good person before He accepts you. He accepts you just like you are. That's why He came, is to let the captives free, to save those who are broken and lost. That is the only condition to accept Him, is that you know you're a leper, someone who is broken from the inside. And then for us who maybe have been walking and journeying with the Lord for a while as His church, as His children, let's continue to look to our prophet. Let's not mix our Christianity with performance and how we must appease God. Let's rest in this perfect work that Christ has done as the true prophet that sits on the throne and that intercedes for us before the Father as our leader and Savior. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this amazing story of 2 Kings 5. Lord, we acknowledge just how much of our own hearts we see in this passage. Lord, in, in so many ways, we're like Naaman who wants to perform before you so that we can be accepted and washed clean of our sins and our brokenness, our failings, the things that overwhelm us. But Lord, that's not the true gospel. You call us to look to you in faith. And thank you that the gospel is so, so simple. You don't require of us to know someone or pay something that we don't have. But you just want us to acknowledge that we are leprous, Lord. We are sinful of nature, Lord. And that you had this perfect life and perfect gospel that saves us. Lord, I pray that for each one of us, whether we are far of knowing you, whether we have a lot of things that still makes us skeptical, Lord, or whether we are believers that have been following you for a long while, Lord. I pray that you continue to point us to yourself. Help us to see Jesus. Holy Spirit, may you continue to use us as instruments in your hand as you expand your kingdom, Lord. Help us to see the Naamans in our lives, people who are lost, who are close to us. Lord, may we not be so caught up in our own worlds and our own struggles, but we don't see those people. Give us the faith of the little girl that will see those people, that our hearts would be broken for them, that we would point them to you, Lord, the true prophet. Please, God, may you use us in those small manners. May we see the privilege they of and the importance they of. We might be overwhelmed with suffering this morning, Lord, and not see these people. Please lift our eyes up to see these people around us. And use us, Lord, as a small, insignificant people to be instruments in your hand. We pray that in your name. Amen.